Welcome to the talk, Playful Introduction to Technology and Co-Creative Prototyping. I'm Mark Schmidt, and together with my colleagues Jan Seidler and Dennis Wilk, I want to talk about two methods that we have developed during the project India, which are called Escape Games and Behavior Driven Prototyping. First of all, let us start with what is India. We are part of a research project, which stands for inclusive development of methods and technologies for supporting everyday activities of young people with special needs. We are working, as the title says, with young people in institutions of the social work, which experience a lack of digital participation due to different circumstances. Our goal is to enable this group to invent, design and adopt technology for their daily needs by themselves. Our approach to this is to first find the needs that this group has in their daily life and develop in, with them in a co-creative manner prototypes for their daily life. And we want to evaluate this process to find common patterns that arise during this. Then we want to adopt off-the-shelf product based on our findings to enable this group to do the prototyping by themselves. During this project, we have developed two methods that we have tested and found interesting. The first method is Escape Games, a playful introduction to technology. And today we want to highlight how we came to the Escape Games, how we implemented them and what we get out of them. Then we want to talk a different method, which we tried in a different group, which is called Behavior Driven Prototyping which is an approach to prototype with and for the target audience. And we will show what is behavior-driven prototyping, where it comes from, and what can be gained out of it. Now, let us start with escape games. First of all, why do we came to the point that we need escape game? What are we want? So we came to the point that we say, how can we activate the participants? How can we bring them to give us ideas? So, and we came to the solution that we need to answer the question, how can we activate participants to sync up ideas without knowing how to build them? Because we think it's not important for them to know exactly how the technology works. They need to understand what they want and that it's possible to do. And we have recognized that the persons we work with have a problem to know what possibilities are there and therefore think that their problems can't be solved by technology or that they think this is just a future thing that can't be done today or is not possible within limited resources. So we think we need to um, give an opportunity to know the possibilities to create good ideas. And our primary question with this approach was what is possible with the current technology. Now, if we look at the existing toolkits, which are made for beginners and which are not focused on experts, we first of all see that all of these kits, which are, for example, micro bits, little bits or similar kits, are made to be used for teaching. Their primary purpose is teaching. And now what is if we look at the tools which are not made for perp uh, for teaching, which are made to prototype really things. Then we come to the point that we see that these points are all targeting experts. They are made for makers. They are made for people who know how the technology works and to apply it. So overall, the currently existing solutions focus on one of the two points, teaching concepts and explain how something is done or focusing on experts which know how the technology works, what it can do and just want to enable them to do a prototype as easy as possible. And that's the problem that all of these kids ask how is something possible. But that's not what we want to learn. We want to show what is possible. What can technology achieve today? What is possible with simple resources in a cheap and easy manner. Our approach to this is to take the 
off-the-shelf solutions that are more made for experts or prototyping makers to allow easy beginners to start with them. And our first approach was to begin with a playful learning phase. So we take the given solutions and bring them in an entertaining context to just show what the current technology can do. What can we do with, the tech, uh, with 3D printing today? What can we do with simple boards like Arduino or simple elements which communicate with ZigBee or MQTT? This can be shown if we bring all these tools in an entertaining context and show through little approaches and goals what is possible with them. To allow the user to understand what can be done with them, how are they used, but they don't need to understand the deeper technology into it. So that's where the idea Escape Games came from. And now the question is, why did we choose Escape game. Why do, do we think this is the appropriate way? Escape games or escape rooms, which is more now name, are a little accumulation of small puzzles. Each of these puzzles can be solved individually and then they are together build a unit with the overall goal to overcome the game. And this approach is really inter interesting as we can use it to show tiny tools of technology in each of these puzzles and you try to use this technology to reach a goal and by using it you understand what is possible with the technology, what can be done with this technology. And all together they bring in a unity and you see that you can build this technology together to bring one bigger process to life. So, How do we now turn something like a tool into an escape game. First of all, our approach was to look at our existing tools. In our case, we have 3D printing available, we have boards like a Raspberry Pi, and we have a lot of ZigBee and MQTT devices like switches, buttons, light bubbles, and similar tools. Now the first thing you need to do is think about the tool out of the box. Think what can you do to bring them in a playful interpretation. And then you think about a big motivation. What is the escape game theme that you want to approach? In our case, we said, yeah, we have a goal. You want to open a big reward chest. So like a, on a map, you have a big goal at the end and you find the chest with the sweets. And then you go on and put the tools that you have into an order to create a roadmap to the, as a pass to the goal to the reward and so you want to try that each tiny part of the puzzles must be solved to reach the end of the puzzle and the big reward. As an example we have used as a first step of an escape game a 3D puzzle. We wanted to show what 3D printing can do and our approach to it was to use an already existing solution which can be found online, a little 3D riddle which contains a key and we wanted to show the uh, participants what is possible with 3D printing. You can see how it works, how it feels, that you can do, create a lot of stuff with this technology. And after the participants found the key, they are able to open the door with it. And behind this door, there is a little invisible door contact. They don't see it right now, but at the moment they are using it, they see how a mirror in the room activates. And there we see how tiny technologies that we have, like a door contact, which is normally used for something like safety reasons, can be used in a different context to activate or deactivate stuff. And this contact activates, as I said, a mirror which we used to present the user a different way and a different approach to present a PC. We have a little computer which powers this mirror and you can see how it embeds easily in the natural environment that you have in your home while also providing the same power that you can have with a PC. 
And the interesting part was that now the users can interact with this computer. In this case, they got a lot of uh, steps and hints that they should do. And this can be used for the next step, in which the users received a little cube, which is really interesting approach to present possibilities of interaction. This cube registers movements that it happens to it. It can be slided, it can be flipped, it can be toggled, and this movement you can use to let the user interact in different ways with your technology. In our case, we thought up a little dancing steps. We said, let the cube dance. And the users need to do the dance steps with the cube by sliding it, rotating it, flipping it. And this allows the user to understand really what is possible with interaction. And by moving this cube around, the user received a password, which he then could use in a keypad that we implemented. This keypad utilizes a housing which was made with a 3D printing pen. And we wanted to show that you can do fast and rapid prototyping with a little pen at this. And thereafter was, we also showed this pen to the participants to encourage how easy it is to create something like this. And we wanted to also show that we combine, can combine these technologies like 3D printing, like the electronics part. And in the, with this keypad, when we solve it with a password, we receive a card, a uniform white card. And every of our puzzles at the end got the user such a card. And we used it with, together with an RFID reader to create a approach to get to the final solution. After all participants have received their individual card, they can use it all together to open the final chess, which was also a combination of 3D printing and motors and ESPs, which then contained the final reward, some sweets or something else that encouraged the user to do the puzzle. And overall, we wanted to show with the steps what can be done with technology, how it can interact with each other, how some things can be done which you do not think about at the beginning. And then there are a lot of possibilities in an easy and to-go market. One thing we want to do really, um, we want to show really excessively was that these things are made by ourselves in an easy to go manner. So we wanted to look, let them look not like finished products, but really like prototypes. We let them in the state they were after we printed them, we do not color them or something like this, to really show the user that this can work and we can do it right out of the box. So what have we done after we have done several of these puzzles with one group? We have found out that this method have a really high enthusiasm. The users were really encouraged to do something, they were motivated and we couldn't stop them. And afterwards we have seen that the creativity of these users have increased widely. They brought up a wide variety of ideas and they thought of about a lot more stuff that they could do because they now knew it's possible because they before they thought this is something that you can't change, that you can't improve. And now we open up this possibility to change, to do something differently, which we found really interesting and entertaining. And one thing which we did not uh, as, um, expected was that the users also shows a big interest in the implementation. They not only wanted to know what can be done, they really wanted to know how we done it. How is this possible? Why did it work the way it works? Because they want to know it to be able to do it themselves this way, which we found really interesting as it shows that this group, which have a lack in digital participation, has this lack not because of they are not interested in it. They have it because they are not available to this technology. But overall, one thing we need to mention is that we only validated it with one big group where we have three riddles that we have going on 
and we need to, to validate this with more group to prove that this method really works well. Now this concludes the method escape games. And now we want to dive a little bit deeper into the prototyping process with behavior driven prototyping, which will be presented by my colleague Jan Seidler. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. In this part of the presentation, we're going to talk about behavior driven prototyping. In the first part, you have seen how to playfully introduce technology. In this part, we're going to talk about how you can start from a given problem, an identified need, and go about prototyping possible solutions. In behavior-driven prototyping, BDP for short, it's all about co-creating the right thing right. But what does this mean exactly? If you have a di double diamond of service design, basically you have two corners. The one corner you have the problem space. This is where all the problems, the pain points you feel are placed. This is where you want to identify the problem. So later on, you make sure you solve the right problem. And this is the solution space. This is basically the space where you come up with novel solutions that will help you solve this problem. It's mainly about ideas and testing out those ideas. This design thinking process, we're going to get further into the details of how this works. So here we already talked how you define a problem. And as this as the starting point, you begin ideating, you begin conceiving new solutions. And it's important to know there's no good or bad ideas, mainly only ideas that you start off with. You collect them and after a session of ideation, you go to the prototyping. When you prototype possible solutions, what you're trying to achieve is to see how those ideas play out in the real world, how they work, how they interact with the real world so that you can, so that maybe it sparks new ideas and you see how this really works in context. And for this to see, you have to test it. You have to test these prototypes in a given context so that you evaluate if it's feasible or not. And if not, you go back into the ideation period and you begin come up, coming up with new ideas and then prototyping this. And of course, these tests can help you reveal some insights about the problem that maybe can lead you to redefine it because it wasn't fine-grained enough. So as you can see, this is not a strictly linear process, but one that is with more itera iterations, it's iteratively, and with feedback loop loops that help you inform the previous step so that you come up with more relevant solutions and better ideas, of course. The core research question of BDP is how can we bridge the gap between building the right thing and building the thing right? So this was the problem space and solution space we talked about. And further research questions of which I'll only read two are basically how can disabled or socioeconomically disadvantaged juvenile groups participate in the process of prototyping? Which level of abstraction is suitable for the process to be easily grasped and fun to use? The second is, is behavior driven development applicable in the domain of prototyping with vulnerable groups? How could it be adapted to promote participation and thus co-creation in prototyping? So at the end, you want to have the most relevant end solutions that are also applicable in context. How can you go about from this abstract processes of ideas to more concrete functionalities of prototypes? The components of BDP are various, are several, sorry. The first is setting a goal, the second planning examples, and so on and so forth. We're going to discuss them in detail right now. As a first step, you want to set a goal. Why? Because it helps you focus your attention on the most essential aspects of this endeavor. You want to carry out a given task and it helps you steer in the right direction when you know where you're, where you're headed. As an example, 
In case of emergencies, I want to be able to call my supervisor remotely from the place where I am currently working without having to go out looking for this person. The signal should be sent out and received under three seconds. So it has to be concrete enough so that you know when this goal has been reached. As a second point, we plan in examples. Often when developers and target person or, or customers talk to one another, it's, there's always a risk of misunderstanding. Mainly because the developer doesn't know what the target pe person actually wants or needs, or the target person doesn't know what the, what the developers are capable of. So you have to get them to co communicate with one another. And what best common language can be used to achieve this? using examples. Examples is something that many parties and many stakeholders can understand. This is a very, very effective way to remove misunderstandings. Speaking of examples, pun intended, given I am working in the kitchen when I call out for help, then a supervisor should almost immediately know there's a case of emergency in the kitchen. So having these examples help us focus on the intentions and patterns of users. Because the user behavior is a key concept behind this usage-centered design. You want to know how the user is going to use the system so that it's also relevant and it helps solve the problems he has in everyday life and to help fulfill an everyday need. What we want to create with this BDP is an immersive experience. We want to be able to, to talk with different stakeholders and give them the perspectives and show them the perspective of another user. For example, uh, an instructor. How would an instructor think about the system? How, how would he behave with the system? What would he do with a given end solution? This is very important because if we care about system behaviors, then the end solution that is going to be produced will directly meet the everyday needs of users. It's the users we need to understand and how they're going to use this. And for this, of course, we need a shared language, a shared understanding. And this is the ubiquitous language. It starts off basically with an identified need, right? a pain point that we mentioned before from the problem space. What BDP is not suitable for is not suitable for yet is for needs assessment this is not its goal but but it as a further needs can be discovered in this prototyping process and existing needs can be ref refined or redefined so maybe it's more like a needs refinement if possible it can be used for this after you tested the prototype it can help you refine uh, an identified need if necessary an example for such a need would be for, I get annoyed when I have to go looking for the instructor in case of an emergency. So this is like my motivation or my starting point for, from which I want to solve this problem. This is the defined problem from which we start. Then we go to ask ourselves, okay, how can we reduce the cost of translation? How, how can we get the stakeholders to communicate effectively. We want to have smaller feedback loops. Feedback is very important to any given endeavor. And with features, it has to have shorter feedback loops so that we get gain insight faster. And our conversations have to revolve around examples because examples help us establish this joint communication or shared language. And to identify a stakeholder, an everyday effect, and an end and everyday value, so that we produce something meaningful out of this, it's user stories. User stories help us to frame this in a manner which we can later understand from any given perspective, what actually matters or what actually is trying to be achieved. And ma many of you know many of you may know from behavior-driven development this given when then format basically what you say it is given an initial context when 
a certain action occurs in the system or the stakeholder performs, then you have an expected outcome after this action has been carried out. So this is how it would be structured. This is only an idea. This is, it's not important, mainly it's not important how the format is, but how you can achieve a shared, un shared understanding and how can you spark a meaningful conversation around any feature. So you start off with a role as a qualificant in a working area. I want to call the instructor. This is the action that you're going to perform. And the everyday value that arises from this is so that in case of emergencies, I can find her more quickly, invest more meaningfully my working time and don't disturb others while they are working. So from this point onward, we have to formulate an acceptance criteria so that we know when we develop this feature, when it is going to be complete. It has to be in simple language so everyone can understand. So the call recipient is within sight of the instructor. Qualificant calls her, qualificant presses a button, and button starts flickering on instructor. After this has been formulated, we have to see the perspectives of this functioning prototype. We have to see, in case of examples, scenarios have been very frugal in our process. And in this case, you will know that it's BDP scenarios. Why? We will get into that in the next slide or two. But basically you say, given I'm wor currently working in the kitchen, when I press a button, then an LED on the inst instructor should blink on and off. This helps you frame the examples in a way that you can give this to a developer and he can start developing uh, this prototype without having to, to assume too many things because the requirements have already been gathered. So here's an example that we did with one of our partner faculties. We just wrote in the board, it, I get annoyed when I have to look for the instructor. This you have already seen. This was basically this user story up here. In the next step, this is the important part I, was, I mentioned here in the BDP scenarios. You go about handling prototyping cards or later tangible blocks, but this is going to be your ubiquitous language, your shared understanding. For example, there's a knopf, a button, or a sound sensor, upstand sensor, or display. Like you can see also here in the right, you have actually a display that later on you can build, you can use to construct something. And this is the focus of this BDP scenarios, that you use things that exist, that can be implementable in this prototyping lab, so to speak. So that in the end, anything that you produce out of this process can be built right, right away. And for this to happen, the most crucial aspect is to have the three amigos in place. What does this mean? That you have the most important, or you have all the stakeholders in one room communicating with one another. Because in our case, it were the target person, social workers, and developers. The target person experience their daily lives. The social workers know the competencies and limits of this target person, and the developers are those which determines which features are implementable. And like, like the name implies, it's a highly colla collaborative process. Like any story, for it to be complete, you, you have to have the different perspectives come together. So no single person has the full answer to a problem. So that is why you have to structure this process around meaningful discussions around features and everyone talking to one another. So as a last component of BDP, we're going to talk about tangible blocks. These tangible blocks or Technikblöcke in German serve to spark a tangible conversation around cause and effect. Because Often when we talk about requirements and ideation, we have abstract concepts that are discussed, but maybe even if we write it like when this happens, then that occurs, it can be quite disengaging if it's only in a textual representation. 
So we want it more engaging and inclusive. Basically, we want to iterate through levels of abstraction. For example, you have already seen the prototyping cards. These cards seen here, for example, these are meant to represent the later blocks that not exist as of yet, but we're working on it. And in sense, it represents things that actually exist in the prototyping lab. So when we have these blocks later on, we are able to engage in this medium fidelity prototyping because as you may well know, there is this low fidelity prototypes that are, for example, paper prototypes. You just sketch something on a, on a piece of paper and this should represent very early form of the prototype. This saves you a lot of time. And in the other end of the spectrum, you have high fidelity prototypes, which are, are already components that have been built, that work, that already have, they communicate with one another and have a sort of smartest, smartness in them from a term used from Internet of Things. But what if we just said we want something in the middle, like really not, not too rudimentary like lo-fi prototypes, but not too time costly like high fidelity prototypes. So we want to shorten the feedback loops and make this process also more agile so that we have even more steps in between so that this ideation, prototyping and testing becomes more and more shorter in feedback loops. And this enables us to carry rapid experiments and quick prototyping. And in the end, we have tangible artifacts that can be seen in context. This would be this pro preliminary testing so that every participant in the room, you don't have to wait three hours until the prototype is built or even a week or so. At that moment in time, you can see what happens if I press this button. Will that lamp go on? Will that fan go on? Or will someone be called? That's the question. Here we engage in this process, but in a whiteboard. And if there is only one person in a whiteboard, there's not much participation, is there? But ideas have been collected, and we would like this process to be even more tangible, where everyone, even around a table, can engage in. So this is the basic idea. You have some blocks, for example, a button, LED, rotary switch or dimmer, and a speaker. These are the components that you can get them to communicate with one another. For example, if you integrate a button with an LED, if you press a button, then an LED will blink on and off. But maybe you say, no, nah, I want a dimmer for the light because I want to represent the case of emergency even more so. So I control the brightness of this. But maybe in another, there comes another idea from another participant that says, maybe with the speakers, it should just speak emergency because the instructor would have this receiver maybe in her bag and she cannot see the light. So it needs sound. And then comes the idea, oh, maybe we can also use a rotary switch to control the volume of the speaker. Or we can speak out the degree of emergency. So if it's very urgent, then it would be much louder. And if not, much lower or maybe another thing like alarm, alarm, something like this could be used for this. And this ties quite nicely with BDP scenarios. Like you can see, it's a standing for this. You can say, given I am currently working in the kitchen, when? And then you press the button. And then you see how an LED blinks on and off. And in the case that this block doesn't exist yet, either an existing prototype card or blank card will be used instead until this block is built. And in the end, you have these requirements that are gathered and you can see how these requirements that you formulated as user stories, acceptance criteria, and later on in BDP scenarios can be used directly in the code as a sort of testing because it's hard to test prototypes in real world. Like, how would you do it? In software, you have JUnit, like this framework for testing code. But how can you test something tangible? How can you test something existing in the real world with its behavior? So basically you say, if this thing behaves 
as I think it should, then I accept it as being functional. And after this has been built, after you have gathered the requirements with the three amigos and so, you have high fidelity prototypes. So as you see, it ties quite nicely into this iterative step-by-step -step process to from, from abstract ideas and then you base yourself around the conversation around examples and then step by step you go into more and more high fidelity prototypes and you test in each phase and each step you test the validity or the feasibility of these prototypes. So to conclude, participants had only limited technical experience before, not much, but they showed high self-interest in developing own ideas and the requirements gathered with BDP were in a fun and engaging manner. Fun and engagement is very important for people to want to co-create. You have to motivate them to come in with novel ideas, to talk to one another, to, to, to complement this and that idea and discuss this, why this idea maybe w will not work. And this is the conversation that we're trying to achieve with this process, the three amigos, the different stakeholders that talk to one another. And of course, sparking new ideas from participants led to a co-creative experience that everyone in the room could enjoy. Thank you very much for your attention.